Today we are beginning a new sermon series called Strength for the Day, Hope for Tomorrow. It's our stewardship series this year, which will be focusing on the, the strong history of St. James over the last 50 years, of the legacy of faithfulness and growth that this church has experienced, while also pointing us to our hope for the future, for what God has in store for this church in the next 50 years. And it's my hope and my prayer that we can commit to one another, and more importantly, commit to God being present online or on campus as we walk through this series together, as we commit our time and our energy and our resources to growing the kingdom of God that is here at St. James. I invite you to pray with me this morning. Close your eyes, take your palms and place them on your lap and take a few big deep breaths. As you breathe in, breathe in the spirit of the living God that is present with you wherever you are right now. And as you exhale, I want you to get rid of all of those things that are separating you from God, those, those fears, those doubts, the shame. And allow yourself just to be in God's presence today. Repeat the words of this prayer out loud after me so that it becomes our prayer united together. Gracious God, in the silence of this moment, prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word for us this day. Work your will in our lives. Amen. So sometimes there are things that happen in between writing a sermon on Monday morning and preaching a sermon on Sunday morning. And last Monday, as I was preparing for this sermon, we were coming off the high of our victory over Texas A&M. Things were looking good in Hogland. The national media was fawning all over us. And then yesterday happened. But anyway, What the national media was fawning over was Sam Pittman and the coaching job that he's done. And how he's turned around a program that was absolutely abysmal, right? They were winless in conference play. They were atrocious in non-conference play. They were, the, the team culture and morale was an all-time low. Things were really bad. And, and they've been wondering how he was able to resurrect and right the ship. And some have pointed to his hires of his assistant coaches, right, the defensive and offensive coordinators. Some have, have pointed out, uh, called attention to his recruiting and some new talent that he's brought into the team. Others have claimed it was the X's and the O's and just outsmarting the competition. And while no one's ever asked me to be a sports pundit, I do have an unprofessional opinion. That all those things may be true, but I, I think identity is the thing that he's done best. That he's come in and helped every player understand who they are and how to be the very best version of themselves. And he's restored a team identity where there wasn't one at all. Because knowing who you are can have a really powerful impact on your life. Knowing who you really are can help you make decisions, can lead you forward, can be an agent of success. But I don't think we often ask that question of who am I? What's my identity? Because a lot of times we think about what we are. When asked about to describe ourselves, many of us start with our career, what we did or what we do for a living. I am my job. Maybe we discuss our marital status, whether we're married or divorced, widowed, Maybe we talk about our kids, how many we have, and we talk about who we are through what our children are doing. Or maybe we go back to our family, where we're from, if our parents were strict or not strict, if we had siblings, where we are in the birth order. All these things matter, but they're not the answer to the question, are they? Who are you? I think that there's a need for some critical self-reflection about who we really are that I might need to take some time and be more introspective about who Ben Crispin really is. And am I the the person that I want to be? As a pastor, as a husband, as a father, as a son? Understanding identity can be really important, but I don't think we give it enough time. I don't think we dive into this deeply enough to peel back the layers of the what that we do to find out the who that we are. 
But the good news is, is that the who we are is found in Scripture. And the other good news is we don't have to look very far. We're going to be reading in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. And friends, you've got three ways to read this scripture with me. You can, there's a Bible in front of you that's on the back of your bulletin, or you can follow along on the screens. But every English teacher I ever had told me that you remember something better if you read it and you hear it at the same time. And so let's read scripture together this morning. Again, it starts in verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the air and to every bird, beast of the earth and every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You see, friends, our identity is a child of God who is made in God's own image. That may be something we've heard for most of our lives, that we're made in the image of God, but what does it really mean? How does it impact our lives? What kind of difference does it make that we're made in God's image? You see, friends, I think that many of the problems and the challenges that we face today, the many of the struggles that we go through, are because we fail to understand what it means to be made in the image of God. That we fail to grasp the whole reality of what that means for us. I think that when we struggle with, with sin and temptation, it's because we don't understand who we really are. That when we have confidence issues and we don't believe in ourselves to be able to do something that's out of our comfort zone or that's new, it's because we don't remember who we are and what it means to be made in the image of God. I believe that when we lean on our vices, it's because we are, it's easier to do that than it is to tackle the work of moral character development. You see, friends, I think a lot of the issues that we face where we speak down to ourselves. We talk badly about ourselves to others, about the parts of our personality that frustrate us that we wish we could remove. We think about and mull over every word that we've said that was, could have been perceived in an in a un, unforgiving way. We think about the actions of our past and we regret the things that we've done and the sinfulness and the way that we, that we spoke to others. And all of these are because I don't think we understand what it means to be made in the image of God and what kind of impact that can have on our lives if we grasp the truth of it. Identity matters. Who you believe you are matters. It changes how we live, it changes how we speak, it changes our priorities. And so understanding identity has got to be paramount to our lives of faith. And so there's some truth that I want us to claim today because God didn't make us in God's own image for us not to claim it. God wouldn't go to the trouble to make us different than every other creature if it wasn't on purpose. And so there's some truth here that I think we need to pull out that's revealed to us in Scripture. And you can find these on the back of your bulletin there. They're kind of in a little block if you want to jot some notes down for your own. But the first is that God shared God's own nature with us. God shared God's own nature with us. God made us, humanity, differently than anything else. And God poured some of God's own nature into us. And now if you've been with us for a few months, you remember that back in August we preached a sermon about the nature of God. And we talked about God being creative, God being powerful, God being loving, God being generous, God being kind and compassionate. If that's God's nature, that's what's in you. What it means to be made in the image of God is that God's character is inside of you. That you have the capacity 
to do God-like things because God put God's own nature inside each and every one of us so that we have the capacity to be generous, that we have the capacity to be sacrificed, that we have the capacity to be loving, that we have capacity to be creative, to be powerful, to do incredible things for God's kingdom to be built. We have that capacity inside of us. That's what it means, friends, to be made in the image of God. And so in those moments when we begin to doubt ourselves and doubt what we're able to do and think that we're too old to make a difference anymore or we're too young to matter or we think that we don't have enough power or status in society, it's in these moments that we doubt ourselves. We've got to remember who we are, that we are made in the image of God and that God's nature is inside of us. When we are called to go beyond our our comfort zone, to reach out into some new mission or ministry, to be present in a new way, to speak to someone at work who is hurting or to reach out to a friend and you're unsure of what to do and we begin to doubt our ability to make a difference in their lives, we've got to remember who we are. We are God's children made in God's image and God's nature is inside of us. You are good. The truth is this, friends, you are good. And you are capable of doing incredible things in God's name. You are capable of being a part of God's miraculous work in the world because God marked you. You have the ability and the capacity to make a difference in someone else's life. You know why? Because you were knit in your mother's womb with the same hands that hung every star in the sky, with the same hands that formed the mountains and the valleys, with the same hands that poured the oceans into the sea. Those hands knit you with purpose and intention. That's who we are. And that's what we're capable of. But friends, God didn't just create us so that we could sit back and bask bask in the glory of what it means to be made. No, God created us for a purpose. And I know, I know that that is one of like the utmost cheesy pastor lines, isn't it? Right? God has a purpose for your life. But did you read this? Did you hear what God did? Chapter 1, verse 26 through 31 of the first book of the Bible. Did you see what God did? No sooner had God created us, no sooner had God formed us in God's own image, than God speaks to us. Now, if you're reading the whole rest of the creation story, God doesn't speak to the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. God speaks to us. And what does God say? Be fruitful, multiply, and steward creation. God gives us a calling and a commission from the very beginning. At our first breath, God is giving us a calling and a commission, a purpose, a reason that we were made to represent God here on earth, that we were created in God's image so that we could bear witness to God's creativity, to God's generosity, to God's power, to God's presence, and to God's love, that that's why we were made here. But did you see even more? Is that God says to be a steward to all of creation. You know what that means? Is that God created us. This is so beautiful to me. God created us with the express intention for us to be able to help each other blossom and thrive. The reason we're here is to take care of each other, to nurture one another and all of creation in a way that it is able to be the very best version of itself, the very best thing that God could have ever created. God put us here so that we could be fruitful, so that we could help each other bear fruit of joy and happiness and peace and love, so that we could be a people who love each other and so care for one another that we care about their thriving and their blossoming more than we do our own. This is what it means to be a steward over all creation. And this is what job God gave us from the very beginning. We're in chapter one of Genesis. And God has already told us explicitly what we're supposed to do. Be people who care, who nurture, who steward, who love, and who help others grow. Friends, if you've been hanging out in a church for very long, 
you're pretty typically aware of, of the pattern of the church year and that in October begins the stewardship series. And for many of us, and even myself as a pastor, typically that stewardship series is about making sure that every church member gets a pledge card and everybody thinks about how much money they want to give for the next year and they all make a commitment and we come together as a church and we say this is what we're going to do to be generous to God and to God's kingdom. And that's part of what we're going to do. But friends, if we don't understand our identity as stewards, then stewardship is just a yearly campaign with a pledge card. This isn't something we do six weeks out of the year. This is who we are every second of our lives. We were created to be stewards. Men and women of faith who use the resources that God has given us, our time, our energy, and our finances to build God's kingdom, to make a difference in others' lives, to reach out, to share the good news, to know Christ and make Christ known. We are called to stewardship. Not just for six weeks, not just in six sermons where the preacher talks about money, but for our entire lives, we are a people who are called to be stewards. We were created for it. Stewardship is our identity. To use what we've been given by God to build God's kingdom, to care for God's creation, to love one another so that all can thrive. This is what it means for us be a people of faith. And so this stewardship sermon series, it's less about filling out that pledge card and more about learning who we are as stewards, who we are as God's people and remembering what it means to be made in the image of God. Amen.